radical simplification, human-centric improvement, and obvious value. The three cornerstone benefits achieved via the tech frenzy of ChatGPT in the broader category of generative AI. A ripple, a disruption, an innovation disrupting other innovation. When ChatGPT was first introduced, there was this splash of rapid and ubiquitous usage. The technology was positioned in very simple terms everyone could understand. You enter a prompt, and you generate a piece of content, or generate a visual. Educators and parents alike said, oh my god, our kids can cheat on their papers. And if you're paying $50,000 in college tuition, that thought has crossed your mind, and I'll give you the answer. They are, not that they're cheating, they're using generative AI. Or like me, a recent trip to a museum, you enter a prompt, my prompt happened to be a happy group of frogs playing in an orchestra in space, and you get this. Chat GPT created ripples. And by the way, the context for that is, I'm a Trekkie, I like Star Wars, I play the violin, and you know, who doesn't like frogs? They're happy little creatures. But research papers, blog posts, emails, people started paying attention. Now, entering a prompt and returning a research paper is vastly different than enterprise application of generative AI. But it is the latest example of consumer tech influencing and informing enterprise technology. Now, I admit in the enterprise, it's a lot harder. You have your own LLMs, you have microservices, modular architectures, strategic alliances, ethics, privacy. It is absolutely complex to deliver radical simplification, human-centric improvement, and obvious value. But there is tremendous opportunity to adopt a similar approach and mindset in the enterprise. There's value that can be accrued to companies who achieve those three benefits that ChatGPT achieved. But really, let's look at how and why ChatGPT achieved this, right? Because when you think about it, generative AI has been in the market for a number of years. Ripple number one. They launched a simple product that could be used for a variety of different use cases. They took something inherently complex, requiring a lot of compute, analytics, processing, and simplified the product and its associated experience. It was delivered and understood with elegant simplicity. No PhD, no training manual, no YouTube video, no human interaction. Simply understood. Ripple 2. They applied technology to the human experience. Now, this wasn't technology accelerating transactional processing capabilities. The value came directly as a result of changing a human experience. It was intrinsically personal. Ripple 3, they delivered obvious value. ChatGPT demonstrates the impact that technology can deliver when tangible value is delivered in a very clear, very visible way, as a user, as a consumer, a buyer, I can clearly see my way to value. It's palpable, it's real. Now there's this enormous satisfaction as a user of generative AI, right? The product, again, is so easy and intuitive to use. It translates my human creativity into something real and I receive an immediate benefit. It has ripple effects. Now, on my way here to the conference, took an Uber, and from obviously the airport to the convention center, and the driver says, I love statistics. He's like, I love ChatGPT. He's like, I love it so much because it allows me to generate visuals and use cases. And he loves it so much that he now has the higher version of ChatGPT that he pays for. That's delivering a great customer experience. Now, shifting gears, let's really look at our environments and what we actually develop and deliver. IT infrastructures have grown. Ecosystems have expanded. The need to address multi-use cases and business case justification for multiple stakeholders has increased. As a result, our offerings have become often bloated Right? and even more complex in our quest to satisfy all those other stakeholders. We offer these rich feature sets, only of which a really small percentage are taken advantage of, and our product roadmaps struggle to be differentiated. Additionally, your customers struggle to define hard ROI from their tech investments, 
and often their decisions are layered in buyer's remorse. Now, our intentions are good, but the pace of complexity is increasing, and we aren't doing enough to deliver a simplified experience, a valuable experience, a human-centric experience. Now, generative AI is going to be the next wave of transformation for consumers, and it presents a similar opportunity for the enterprise. It's actually a catalyst to rethink innovation, and that innovation could be our products and our services, or our processes and our practices. Now, there's an expectation that enterprise tech will deliver the same tangible benefits that consumer tech does. That means as product managers, you've got to bring those expectations into your product roadmaps. As tech marketers, you need to simplify the buying journey. You need to elevate the customer experience. You need to crystallize in buyer's mind the value that they're going to receive. Gen AI is a single drop one of many yet to come that has created ripples. It makes us reconsider our approach to innovation and everything that surrounds that. Applying the status quo no longer works. We need a new approach to deliver enhanced value, not only for our businesses, but for your customers' businesses. So as we kick off this year's Tech Growth and Innovation Conference, we're going to share with you three types of organizational approaches to innovation, factors that impact your efforts to innovate, and the attributes and culture that distinguish those organizations that successfully innovate. As tech leaders, our ask of you is for you to rethink or disrupt the way your organizations approach innovation. Now that can be at the organizational level or it could be at the functional level. The following concepts can be applied to marketing and product strategies. The new approach will need to revolve around radical simplification of the complex a very human-centric philosophy, and an acutely visible path to value. These are the ripples of disruption. Thank you, Jen. Gartner's found there's actually three types of innovators. The first one is the innovator that doesn't do anything, just simply reacts to what's happening in the market or the tech trends. They're the organizations that are at the biggest risk of being marginalized and replaced with tech providers offering new products with the latest innovations. So those innovation type ones are essentially putting their hand in the proverbial beach sand, as you can think of it. So think about yourselves. Are you proactively tracking and monitoring what's going on in the markets, looking at the predictions, the top trends? Are you reading the Gartner research that's out there showing you what's happening or what will happen in the future? If you're not, you're at risk of being marginalized. The second type of organization is the one that takes a traditional process and reinvigorates it by leveraging new technologies. Take, for instance, a company near and dear to my heart, a company called Gotta Groove Records. Now, some of you may know that I'm really into 70s rock albums. Anyone recognize this one? Led Zeppelin. Yeah, there, there's something magical, though, about albums. I grew up on them. And, you know, the artwork, being able to look at the liners, you know, we actually see the lyrics, hear the music the way it was supposed to be actually played. Most of us, younger people probably don't know what a B-side is. It comes from this, the vinyl. As you can tell, this is one of my passions. And God of Groove is leveraging this, capitalizing on this for musicians and emerging artists that can take their existing music and convert it into vinyls. There's a rich, warm sound about it. It actually is not compressed like you have with digital music, for instance. And the way Gotta Groove is actually taking advantage of this is not just addressing this new or emerged or reinvigorated consumer experience. They're actually leveraging new technologies, new materials, and even production processes. So the record manufacturing and, and actually the chemicals that are used are completely different from what we saw in the past. So you think about it, by doing this, not only am I addressing a consumer need, a new emerging one that's revamped, but also being able to deliver an even better experience with new, more modern vinyl records, as you can see. Of course, vinyl records are also still produced from some type of master source but it's done from now digital audio sources versus done from analog, like magnetic tape. 
allows for more precise control over the sound quality, resulting in better fidelity. So I'm highlighting this because God Group is a great example of a tech innovator, but what they're doing is taking an old manufacturing process and invigorating it with, uh, you know, essentially new technologies. In this case, addressing those audiophiles that really appreciate that nostalgic sound of being able to listen to music on vinyl. So think about it. Is this you? Are you an innovation type two, taking existing processes and revamping it and reinvigorating it with the latest technology? The third type of innovator, innovation type three, is the one that takes technology but applies it to new problems or new markets. Take, for instance, a company called Oyster Financial. Oyster Financial is one of Africa's leading financial and alternative credit firms. So Oyster provides millions of African adults with a credit listing, enabling them to get access to credit anywhere. So you're probably going, okay, what's the big deal? Most Africans do not use banks. They're called what's called, referred to as unbanked which means that they are actually off of the financial grid. And as a result, the continent has long suffered being able to provide credit and financial resources to various marginalized groups, such as farmers, who can't get credit to buy new equipment, even though they are really the backbone of food provisioning on the continent. There's a lot of gig workers, as you can imagine, ride-sharing, delivery vehicles. They can't get credit to up-level their vehicles, as an example, and informal merchants. That makes up 70% of the African economy, these little stalls and kiosks, yet they're not able to get credit to buy new products either. So you can see it's a major problem. So what Oyster does, they offer tailored credit products for each of these marginalized groups. They also allow their credit services via APIs to be baked into the ride hailing and delivery platforms that these marginalized groups are already using. The company uses a combination of analytics and AI, both to accept, really to assess the credit worthiness of these individuals, but what also is unique is that they use alternative data sources, such as looking at their mobile phone usage, social media uh, activity, and, and even their purchase transaction history. These alternative sources help them to be able to identify who's gonna be someone who's willing, gonna be able to pay back and more willing to pay back any type of loans that they have. So Oyster is really addressing an unmet need in this African market, helping consumers who wouldn't have access to credit or be able to build a history. It's a great example of a tech provider who has taken a human-centric approach by actually taking an application that's radically simple and making it easy to use for these underserved individuals. So think about it. Is this you? Are you taking an innovation type three approach is your company using the latest technology to be able to go after new markets and offer new product and services? Sometimes the spark of innovation to use technology is driven by responding to a consumer need or finding a market opportunity that's unmet, as we saw with both Gotta Groove and Oyster. Now, while you may not be in the consumer market, there's always something new that we can learn from companies outside our own space from understanding what makes a product and simple and easy to use to understanding what delivers value that is immediately something that users can see. So let me ask you, how can you find some of these new and underserved opportunities? So as Jim mentioned, how do we navigate, find, and then assess those opportunities? Now Gartner uses impact and opportunity radars. I'm actually going to share an example of an opportunity radar, specifically for generative AI, but you can use this for any tech, combination of tech, or even a concept that you're assessing and evaluating. So on the y-axis, it shows a spectrum of activities from customer facing to internal operations. Now the two upper zones is where AI is used directly to either in customer interactions or it's embedded in your products and services that you're selling to customers. The two lower zones is where AI is embedded into your core capabilities and your internal operations. It's where AI is used behind the scenes by your employees. Now the x-axis highlights everything from everyday AI to game-changing AI. Now everyday AI, AI is focused on productivity. That's your efficiency, doing things faster, right? So software engineers write code faster. Marketers might generate copy in minutes. 
the game-changing AI, that's where you have creativity and innovation layered on top of AI's productivity improvements, and you end up with a better product or a more effective campaign. Now, this creates opportunity zones, and you can take your potential opportunities, which at Gartner we refer to as use cases, and map them in each of these four zones. Now, the radar is designed to put your enterprise or your function at the center and looking for opportunities that are within reach and feasible for you. So the three rings of the radar represent feasibility, and they're a combination of technical feasibility, so your organization's ability to implement the technology, internal readiness, which is your ability to incorporate the use cases or use cases that you're assessing, and then external readiness, the extent to which your customers, partners, any external stakeholders are accepting of the technology that you're investigating, again, in this case, generative AI. Now, for the last year, I've been spending a lot of time with tech marketing leaders and product marketing leaders and thinking about their use cases and the opportunities, and I want to share a couple of examples with you today. The first is Metadata Solutions, a life sciences co company. And guess what? They're using generative AI for content development. At least 90% of you are probably doing the same thing. It's one of the primary use cases for tech marketing teams and product marketing teams. Not surprising. Another example is they're assessing it for pre-content generation, incorporating all these assets and information, trying to develop a really robust brand differentiation and positioning. And the third use case, which is really interesting, they're using AI-generated automation, trying to get patients the right treatment at the right time. Now, when you consider clinical trials, there's all these multiple dimensions, and they're using algorithms and the most advanced techniques for Gen AI to create synthetic clinical trial data. They're then using this data to create clinical, clinical trial processes to identify efficiencies and also be able to identify if they're going to be able to deliver better patient outcomes. It's complex. It's a little harder, right? But if achieved again, it addresses internal operational efficiencies and it delivers incredible customer experience, better patient outcomes. Now, another example is HubSpot. And HubSpot's product marketing teams probably exemplify a lot of the balancing act that you all in the audience are facing. So you have generative AI. Well, how do I embed it in my internal processes? And then to what extent do I embed it in my products and services? Right? So they're looking at internal and embedding. They call their embedded products HubSpot AI. Now, to make their own internal processes better, right, they're using Gen AI to create first drafts of landing page and ad copy, saving hours of copywriting time. Another one, because HubSpot has all this robust data, they're experimenting, experimenting with personalized landing pages. Another one is a marketing to sales handoff. So they're using an auto prospecting tool. When a customer or prospect shows an interest in AI, there's a personalized email that is sent to them and offering them to connect with someone internally at HubSpot who can talk about how they can integrate AI into their current systems and infrastructure. Now, they're also obviously looking at how they can embed generative AI into their products and how they can deliver more value for their customers. And it's not only just embedding Gen AI into their products, but also consistently articulating the messaging and the vision of how AI can drive value for their customers. You can see the ripple effects, single drops of innovation. Now, when you about your own ability to innovate, you're going to have to think of your use cases. You're going to have to assess your own feasibility, right? Is this a near-term investment that's going to drive operational efficiencies for me? Or is this going to be game-changing and thus roadmap-changing investment that's going to put you in front of new customers or enable you to develop new offerings? Now, this radar explores generative AI, but again, it can be used for any sort of tech. Most likely moving forward, the most disruptive opportunities will be as a result of combining technology. That's what's going to drive new offerings, new business models, new industries. So a radar helps by giving you a starting point a single drop to create ripples, a way to navigate an approach and visually represent the feasibility of your use cases to help you prioritize your efforts. But what else can impact your ability to innovate? 
Sometimes, rather than looking for opportunities, the opportunities find you. External forces often serve as some of the biggest catalysts for innovation, prompting organizations to have to adapt and evolve in response to changing circumstances. Now, there are a number of external forces that have historically driven or impacted innovation, such as changing consumer behaviors, preferences, market competition, and even government regulations. These external forces can vary in terms of their impact and duration, but they all have the potential to drive innovation by creating new challenges as well as new opportunities. There's another type of unexpected force that can impact innovation, a global event or a crisis. Economic downturns, natural disasters, or geopolitical conflicts can disrupt industries and create opportunities, or as we recently experienced, even a pandemic. Now, I know many of us are tired of hearing about the COVID-19 pandemic again, but there are some interesting lessons, valuable lessons that we can learn from what happened in terms of innovation. The pandemic was really a catalyst for the widespread adoption of a new life sciences innovation called messenger RNA, or mRNA for short, that really helped accelerate the development of a brand new vaccine. But for every external force or tech innovation, there's always secondary and tertiary effects that really create new ripples. While mRNA was the primary innovation triggered by the pandemic, there were a number of effects created by the pandemic itself. Some positive, some negative. On the negative side, we saw multiple industries experience significant challenges and declines as we had restrictions on gatherings, travel limitations, and changes in consumer behavior. Those of us in high tech were also impacted because all of a sudden we couldn't engage customers and prospects in person. We could no longer hold in-person conferences. Even employees couldn't meet in person. This led to a, a major impact in our product development, our sales, and our marketing. But on the flip side, there were some positive things that came out of it. In the areas of things like e-commerce, you know, we saw innovations in e-commerce platforms and last mile delivery to be able to not only deliver products, sometimes different products because our consumer behaviors had changed, but also be able to do it in a safer manner. Of course, we couldn't really meet with our doctors and physicians, so we had to think about new ways that we could actually get healthcare. So we resulted in things such as remote health healthcare solutions, virtual doctor consultations, and patient monitoring devices. And thinking about conferences, we got innovative there. We got creative. We started investing in what's called event tech, which allowed us to be able to hold virtual and hybrid conferences. Now, pandemic also showcased that there were some winners that were simply just providers at the right place at the right time. Just think of Zoom, Peloton, DoorDash, and some e-tailers who benefited from customers switching to remote work, remote exercise, and remote shopping. All of these pr providers made bets that the pandemic simply accelerated. Post-pandemic, of course, not all of these providers are doing as well. Why? Because consumer behaviors again have changed as things have reverted back to normal. Now, there are some companies that really innovated. Take, for instance, a company called Gorilla Tacos. This LA-based food truck turned restaurant had to close its doors to the public. But they didn't just simply shut their doors. They reinvented themselves by offering a whole line of food and beverage kits that could be obtained by no contact pickup. Who would have thought we could get margaritas to go now? Now, one of their best sellers was the emergency taco kit, where you could get not only what you need to make 60 tacos, but they also threw in, you know, 30 eggs and some four rolls of toilet paper, which for some reason for a, you know, for a, you know something that was more, I, I thought it was a respiratory disease, that like we need a toilet paper. Now, I know what you were thinking. Uh, Jim, what does Gorilla Tacos have to do with tech innovation? Nothing. I just thought it was a cool story. <laughs> Actually, what it does show you is innovation is not only technology. Innovation could be an innovative business model, an innovative pricing model, or innovative 
product bundle, as we saw with Gorilla Tacos. But speaking of technology, let's talk about one of the surprising tech innovations that took off during the pandemic. Think about how something as simple as a QR code had a rapid surge in use because of the need for paperless menus and contactless engagement. That's a real QR code, by the way, that takes you to the agenda for the conference. How many of you have heard of a company called Flowcode? Anyone? Oh, one, back here. <laughs> sort of what I thought. Now, while most of you have never heard of them, you likely have seen or experienced their impact in the physical world. What they do, they offer custom QR codes. Using that format to connect the real and digital worlds to increase brand to consumer engagement. Flowcode has partnerships with over 70% of the Fortune 1000 companies, including a lot of retailers and CPG companies. Now, beyond offering custom QR codes, they offer a customer engagement platform, which enables businesses to design and enable specific customer journeys. It also has real-time data analytics to measure and see, you know, and optimize the customer experience. Brands can see the full funnel analysis from the offline media spend all the way to online conversions. Now, to be clear, Flowcode did not invent the QR code. That was done by a Japanese company back in the 90s to track auto parts. Instead, Flowcode saw the QR code as an existing technology that consumers were already familiar with and simply created tailored digital to physical experiences, whether in stores, concerts, or sporting events. Now, Flowcode has seen retailers put codes on everything you can imagine, from wine bottles to shirts, even products and windows in the stores. So the QR codes are making it easier for consumers to find product information, compare prices, and even make purchases. Any sports fans in the audience? Go Boston! Bo we got Boston. Anybody else? Right? Chiefs. The Chiefs, okay, there we go. You'll be happy to know that Flowcode is also the preferred QR pro provider for the NFL, the NBA, and the NHL. That's basketball, football, and hockey, for those of you that aren't familiar with the acronyms. Now, what you may not know, a sports team knows its season ticket holders, but they actually don't know who is sitting on, in those seats on a particular night because of the way the tickets may have changed hands and being sold. So much of the missed engagement for a sporting event is actually in phys physical spaces, in the arena, in and around, like tailgating lots or different areas around the arena. Flow codes provide an opportunity to engage fans at multiple places around the, the arenas and stadiums. So just imagine putting a flow code up on something like a Jumbotron and maybe running a contest. One franchise did exactly that. They offered a signed jersey giveaway that resulted in thousands of, of fan signups. Now, prior to using flow codes, they estimated they only knew about 8% of who was actually in the arena, which is amazing when you think about the amount of technology spend that sporting teams actually make. After using flow codes, that number grew to 70%, and with a majority of the fan signups even new to the franchise. Now, to me, that's delivering value, that's delivering impact. Some sports teams have actually now put flow codes on the back of their arena seats, which allows fans to actually scan it, and it takes them to a specific landing page called the flow page. The page has a lot of resources. People can order food. You can actually um, sign up for a contest. You can also do ticketing for future experiences, as well as get directions around the stadium. So when you think about it, what Flowcode did, they improved on a simple technology to give consumers a more intuitive, easier way to engage brands in the physical world beyond just linking a QR code to a static web page. From connecting fans with sports stars to making it easier for consumers to find information and make purchases, connecting the real and the digital worlds. Now, as you can see, every event, good or bad, can have a ripple effect for those that choose to act. It's the choices you make relative to these catalysts and your ability to take advantage of them that's going to impact your future success. As Jim just mentioned, there are choices you need to make as tech marketing leaders and product leaders. But what choices do certain providers make that allow them to accelerate innovation? 
Now, we've identified four organizational attributes that enable providers to innovate successfully, and what I mean by that is enable and deliver better business outcomes and be able to achieve those three benefits achieved by ChatGPT. And stay with me, because I'll show you how attributes and choices are linked. But the four attributes are cross-functional collaboration, experimental mindset, a data-first strategy, and an evolving ecosystem. So cross-functional collaboration. Our primary research shows that providers that have a culture that reinforces cross-functional collaboration tend to experience and enjoy higher growth, higher pipeline, higher revenue. Now, cross-functional collaboration has been a topic for decades, right? But moving forward, companies won't be able, if they're not aligned on the customer and revenue growth, they won't be able to deliver those outcomes. It's about cross-functional collaboration of defining organizational priorities together. What you're saying yes to, and also what you're saying no to, which is really hard for a lot of providers. It's about delivering radical simplification and delivering a robust customer experience. Now that could mean, as Jim mentioned a couple examples ago, simplifying your contracts, simplifying your pricing strategy, refining your free trial process. So think about, are you an enabler of cross-functional enablement and collaboration? When you walk out of here, consider the alignment connections you have between marketing and your product teams, and can you collectively deliver a better product experience? Next attribute, experimental mindset. The second characteristic really reinforces the focus on the human-centric advantage and the value that you're trying to deliver. It's about an organization's ability to generate ideas across the organization, vet those ideas, and put them forth. It's about an approach, not always, but oftentimes that says, let's test, fail, fail fast, regroup, and move forward. For marketers, that might mean adopting a more agile approach to your A-B testing for campaign and content. For product managers, it might mean adjusting your approach to minimum viable product and vetting new ideas before expending too many resources. So ask yourself, does your organization allow for experimentation? Does it embrace new thinking and ideas? Maybe the marketing team has this great idea for an upcoming product launch. Or maybe product marketing just got some insight into a new buyer trend that could significantly impact your roadmap and put you in front of new customers. Encourage ideation across your teams. Now, third attribute around data. The notion that data is pervasive, persistent, and exponentially expanding, especially when we consider synthetic data in the context of generative AI. The third attribute is also the thing that ties those three benefits together of radical simplification, human-centric improvement, and obvious value. It also provides the intelligence and the insights for us to make informed business decisions. It provides the visibility into customer health. Most providers don't have the customer telemetry that tells them, oh, where should I develop next? Or where is demand coming from? Data will be the underlying foundation. It will be the constant across your organizations. It'll be the underpinning of any strategy forward. So ask yourself, are we elevating our own data strategy to position us to deliver those three benefits achieved by ChatGPT? And the final fourth attribute is about the evolving ecosystem. This one's really about collaborating and pushing that collaboration beyond your four walls. It will require a set of partners that can sit at a table with you and create a blueprint for products, They'll enable you to see those external factors that Jim mentioned. They're both able to identify new opportunities for combined technology. So ask yourself, are you constantly and continually assessing and evolving your ecosystem? Now these attributes are actually about choices, deliberate choices. Each choice causes ripples, ripples that disrupt the status quo and drive innovation. 
So cross-functional collaboration, right? That's about being thorough in, in our choices, looking at things from all angles, experimental mindset, making smarter choices, vetting all the ideas and determining a path forward. Data-first strategy is about informed choices. Do I have the insights to make informed business decisions? And an evolving ecosystem, making strategic choices. Do I have my internal and my external factors that can help me develop my path forward? As I said, each of these choices causes ripples, ripples that disrupt the status quo and drive innovation. You choose to radically simplify. You choose to deliver a very human-centric experience an obvious value, which in turn for you drives pipeline, market share, retention, advocacy. These ripples disrupt the status quo. And you have the ability to drive decisions that result in better business outcomes, again, not only for you, but also for your customers. But how do you adopt these attributes in a way that your organization can actually embrace? Being able to make the right choices requires building the right culture of innovation inside your company, which means embracing the attributes that Jen just spoke about, but doing it in a way that aligns to your unique culture. Now, if you think about it, there's multiple benefits to building the right culture. You know, think about it from being able to prioritize creative thinking and problem solving to come up with innovative solutions, empowering employees to come up with ideas and feel like their ideas are valued and have the freedom to innovate. And of course, being able to be able to react and adapt to whatever circumstances come your way, like a pandemic. Being able to also attract top talent, making your company more attractive to people that are innovators that want to be part of your mission, part of your organization. And by doing this, it's going to lead to longer term sustainability for your organization the long-term viability of your company, so you're not going to be around just for a short period of time. So let's take a look at three tech innovators, tech providers, that have developed their own cultures of innovation. The first one is someone we all know if you've done any type of online shopping. That company is Amazon. Approximately 90% of the innovation at Amazon come from analyzing customer behaviors and desires, and the rest with the company innovating on the behalf of the customer. One of their most widely known go-to innovation mechanisms for all new products and services is the approach of working backwards, starting with the user and the experience to be delivered, specifically how this new product or service will help users do their jobs better. The working backwards concept is really about fleshing out the whole product concept before you write a single line of code. It's about putting yourselves in the user's shoes understanding their situation, what tasks they're trying to accomplish, and imagining a simpler and easier way of accomplishing. It has multiple benefits to doing this, one of which is keeping the teams and everybody focused early on, specifically on the customer, and being able to communicate the product strategy and get alignment with your internal stakeholders. So Amazon's a great example of a tech provider that has built a culture of innovation that focuses on human centricity. Now, remember those things called DVDs or VHS tapes? Remember we had to go to a video store to rent those? Next company was one that disrupted that trend by offering us the ability to get DVDs by mail. You probably know them as Netflix. Now, Netflix is a great example of a tech provider because they've had to reinvent themselves multiple times, and they continue to do so. But it's a result of having a new culture unique culture I'll talk about. One, obviously they switched from renting DVDs by mail to streaming content, licensing content, and now creating their own content, movies and shows. Netflix innovation culture is built, built around what their CEO calls no rules rules. It starts with hiring and retaining the top talent, the very best employees. So one of the things I think is unique is that they view their employees more like a sports team trying to win some type of title championship. So rather than viewing employees as family, like some companies do where you have them for life, like our own family, you can't get rid of them, good or bad, a job at Netflix is something you only do when you're the best person for the position, and it's the best position for you. 
They also prioritize what they call radical candor. It's perfectly normal for some employee to contradict their supervisor in a meeting, especially if they disagree with them. Telling people you disagree with them isn't just normal, it's expected. They see it as helping make their business better. And if you don't speak up, it's considered disloyal. The lastly, they throw out useless policies. Isn't that, wouldn't that be great? Netflix doesn't track hours or days people work. They also minimize the number of approvers and decision-making processes. So this leads to greater accountability and it shows employees that you, know, you care about them but you, actually you trust them. Multiple benefits to this approach. For instance, obviously, being able to attract the top talent and retain them because they thrive in this high performance environment. It ensures everybody is high caliber. Also, the openness and the transparency enables people to act courageously and take risk. It also results in faster, more streamlined decision making, which is a result of having minimal processes and also reducing friction points and approval overhead. So Netflix is a great example of a tech provider that is focused on their own unique culture of innovation. One that's focused on hiring the best people and creating mechanisms that allow them to radically simplify their products and services. The third innovator is a service provider out of Virginia called Maximus. What they do is they work with governments worldwide to provide and support human and health service programs. Now, without an optimal way to innovate, the government sector is, has, you know, both risk, both cost and, and resource inefficiency. We really don't think about the government being an innovator, do we? Fail fast is not something that works in the government, where everything you do, right, every funding must be linked with some tangible results. So as a result, Maximus created an innovation center of excellence. And part of it is what they call a spark tank, very similar to the shark tank we see on TV, where what Maximus does is, you know, employees are able to pitch ideas to a panel of judges who determine funding based on predefined criteria. Multiple benefits to this approach. One, actually creates better cross-business unit collaboration because multiple business units may submit ideas and what they try to do with this innovation COE is try to link them and look for co-funding opportunities. It also creates a great strong culture of innovation with the employees who are motivated to come up with new ideas. And Maximus is viewed as being an innovator in the eyes of the government, right, which helps them get new contracts as well. So a great example of a services provider that has built its company of culture of innovation, really providing obvious value to governments and, of course, government citizens as well. So as you can see, all three of these tech and service providers created their own cultures of innovation setting them up to be able to continuously evolve, introduce new products and services and processes that allow them to stay ahead of the market trends and gain a, maintain a competitive edge. So let me ask you, what is your company's culture of innovation and how are you embracing it in your role? So navigating the path forward to drive innovation can be pretty unclear, but arming yourself with the right attributes, making those deliberate choices that we spoke about, can make the path ahead much clearer. Now, as product managers, as marketing leaders, you are going to need to disrupt your own approach to innovation. You will need to create ripples. Your technology and the combined technology with your partners has the ability to disrupt buyers. It can change the way they buy, what they buy, the frequency with which they buy, the channels through which they buy, and the reasons for which they buy. But you must reconstruct the way you innovate. Now, remember for ChatGPT, we outlined three benefits. Each a single drop, a ripple, innovation, disrupting innovation. One ripple was value, delivering obvious value. One ripple was the human element. The technology wasn't applied to increase transactions or volume or even speed. It was applied to human activity. One ripple was radically simplifying the complex, making the technology invisible and hidden to the user while delivering a new user experience. Now you have a challenging yet exciting opportunity ahead of you. I'm gonna use Netflix's radical candor. For you guys, it's actually gonna to be tough. 
really tough, more challenging and more complex. Absolutely, hands down. It is not going to be simple. It sounds simple, absolutely not. But the exciting part is, if you can hide all that product complexity, if you can hide all that processing complexity, the more you can delight your customers, the more you can give customers what they're looking for in terms of a valuable customer experience. Think about that Uber example that I shared. Don't we all want to elevate the customer experience where the customer relationship expands? And you are more likely to break barriers and reap the reward of greater market share, greater revenue, greater adoption, greater pipeline, whatever your corporate goals are. There's boundless opportunity ahead of you. But you need to disrupt your approach to innovation, either at the organizational level or at your functional level. So as you participate in this year's conference, consider your role as tech leaders and make your motto be that we need to de deliver obvious value, human-centric improvement, and radical simplification. Now, Jim and I want to thank you for coming to this year's Tech Growth and Innovation Conference. It's our biggest event yet. We are super excited. The analysts are super excited. We have new primary research, new frameworks, new trends to share with you. So welcome and thank you. Go create ripples.